So as I said, we'll we'll turn the time over to Rich and the other SAS Blue founders. Um, there was quite a few prerequisites to get this set up. Uh, I know they weren't trivial, so I'm not sure how far people got, but I think we talked about going over some of those issues at the start of this to see if there were problems. And we're, we'll continue this again next week. And we've also talked if, if there's a need, if there's other people that are having problems or we'd like to continue it, we'd even go for a third session as this is the first time we've really done a workshop online. But I think it's a really good opportunity to learn a lot of the, you know, learn about Kubernetes, which isn't, isn't a trivial technology to learn. Um, and I think from the tools we'll see, it makes it a lot easier to get those kind of things set up. So Rich, with that, I, I don't have anything else. You wanna go ahead and start with your presentation? Yeah, sure. Um... So there's there's not much in the way of presentation. Um, this is uh, mostly going to be a, a workshop, a working session. Um, but let me just um, introduce this a little bit, uh, just by you know saying, a, 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 just making a few comments. Uh, one is that you know in the course of creating this demo, um, we've utilized all sorts of different technologies that are really valuable to developers, right? And sort of put it together in, you know, a working model, which is always really nice to have. I started a new job a few months ago and I'm using new programming languages, new technologies, and I have, you know, cloned all sorts of Git repos, um, you know, just, just to see how other people implemented technologies. That's usually the best way to, to learn a new technology is to find a, a working example that is similar to what you wanna do. And then you can sort of use that as a kernel um, toward developing what, what you wanna do and then modifying it to, to do what you need it to do. So, so our goal here with these workshops um, is to get this set up and working for, for everybody that um, that's interested in, you know, in doing this um, so that you can, you know, see how some of these technologies are implemented and then uh, implement similar stuff in whatever you guys are doing, you know, for hobbies or somebody's paying for you to do, um, but, you know, really just add to your human capital. Um, Brett mentioned Kubernetes. Um, we've got, you know, Docker, um, building Docker containers, deploying Docker containers, um, setting up a, a whole, you know, Kubernetes elastic load balancer environment in AWS, hosting a live website. Um, and the website itself, it's a single page web application with browser push technology. The, these are really valuable technologies that employers pay a lot of, of money for, right? Um, these are really valuable skills. Um, and then, of course, SAS Glue is, um, it is a platform that we've developed, which is sort of the glue that, um, that sort of drives the automation of deploying this environment um, automating the, the build pipeline when you make a change to the code um, and then tearing the environment down. So, um, and, and you know, so what, what we wanna do is first sort of go through these prerequisites. Um, this is intended to be interactive Q and A. Let's hear about any issues that people are having um, and try to work through those, those issues together. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, between this session, the follow-up workshop, and possibly another one, you know, get everybody set up so you can deploy the application. Um, and then uh, what we want to do is deep dive into some of these technologies that are implemented in SAS Glue. You know, talk about how we implemented it, why we did it the way that we did, um, you know, I uh, have some Q&A uh, as far as, you know, those types of questions and other ancillary questions. Um, so with that, um, I, I, I guess I'll just open it up to the group. Um, and, you know, for anybody who has 
try to follow the steps in the README, um, the pre-workshop setup. And if you got stuck anywhere, um, I'm happy to, to take questions and we can do some real-time troubleshooting. Um, if anybody was having problems even getting started, uh, you know, we can address that. So, um, you know, let me just, I'll, I'll, with that, I'll just open it up to any questions that anybody has. So Rich, yeah. one, one question I, I had just made for the group, since, since we are dealing with AWS accounts and secret keys and some of those kind of things, I know a lot of those kinds of those things are sensitive. Um, what are some of the things we like, since we're, we're all here and there's chat and we want to get help, but we probably can't share our screens. What are some of the things we should not be sharing, um, you know, in a chat window and stuff like that? Maybe just for everyone here. Yeah, obviously your credentials, right? Your your um, SAS glue and AWS, uh, you know, access keys and secrets. You don't want to show that on your screen or put that in a chat window. Um, as far as you know, IDs of uh, either AWS or SAS glue resources, that's fine. Um, those are internal, and this this whole environment gets. Uh, spun up and uh, and then it'll get spun down, you know, when this is done. So I, I don't think there's um, there's much of a risk there. Okay. But yeah, that's a good thought, Brett. Yeah, don't don't send your your AWS credentials in the chat window for sure. Yeah. And there's not a problem with having the get our GitHub repos that we cloned or mirrored from yours being a public or private one. That's fine too. Right. No, no, I mean, this is, yeah, this is public code. It's a public repo. Yeah, share it with everybody. Okay. So um, I've played with Kubernetes quite a bit already at my work, but um, a lot of what we do is based on stuff from a company called Gruntworks that mm -hmm. has their own like templating stuff that sits on top of Terraform and Terraform ends up doing all the, the uh, Kubernetes stuff. Yeah. Um, it looks just looking through your UI and stuff. It looks like this SAS glue stuff is a lot of like making a web interface for all the stuff you normally do with kubectl or so SAS glue really at, at the core is basically a remote script runner, right? Um, you download the agent, you run the agent wherever you, you know, want to run scripts. You can also run compiled code with it. Um, but then it's basically like this, the same as if you were running it from a command line. So the, the power of it is really in the ability to schedule scripts, um, to you know, automate workflows that cross you know cloud boundaries, um, you know, and on prem to cloud, which, which is sometimes a challenge, right? Like lots of times, when somebody has a process that goes from on prem to cloud, there's this sort of loosely coupled workflow where a file shows up in an S3 bucket, and another process is watching for the file, right? And it's you know, there's not a lot of logging and not a, not a lot of recovery fail over that kind of stuff um, when you have that kind of an environment and you know also it's just sort of a general purpose scheduler like lots of times people use cron you know for scheduling stuff um, which is okay but you know there's lots of issues that come with that um, you know you've got dependencies that are well this job you know, has to finish before this one runs. This one usually takes about an hour. So we'll schedule the other one for like an hour and a half after that one runs. Um, and then just hope the first one finishes. Um, so, so, but, you know, and, and we could, you know, spend more time talking about Saskatchewan. I'm perfectly happy to do that. Um, but this is, you know, I mean, Saskatchewan is part of what we're doing here, um, but, uh, 
but if anybody has any other questions about, you know, getting the, uh, um, the demo environment set up, um, that, that would be good to dig into. Um, one thing just to point out, uh, Clay, um, with Kubernetes and Terraform, in, in, this, in this demo project that we're working on setting up, um, that's exactly how Kubernetes is deployed into AWS is with Terraform, right? So basically Sasko is just running a Terraform you know, script that's setting up that whole Kubernetes environment in AWS, and we're just automating it with SaskLu. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Um, and, and if if not, does anybody want to talk about their experience going through the pre-workshop setup? What what worked? What what didn't? What was what was maybe a, ch a bit of a challenge? Well, I did try and follow along a little bit of the introductory thing in Docker once I got that set up, mm -hmm. and um, that. I, I accidentally hit enter when I meant to hit shift at one point. And so it was like halfway through the command. And when I tried to reset it up, according to the command that told me, it said that name uh, forward slash something was already taken and I, and I had to remove it in order to use it. And so I, I kind of, I didn't know if I'd screwed something up in my environment yet or not because I'm. Okay. Uh, which step was that? It was the, oh, uh, let me pull up Docker again here real quick. Because it was part of the, the tutorial stuff that it had me walk through, or that I just and I don't know that that was necessarily part of your guys' stuff, but it was. I saw it come up as the first time run, you know, tutorial walkthrough. So, um, was this part of the the steps in the README? Um, it came up as part of the Docker after I re rebooted my machine. Oh, oh, okay. The Docker, the Docker for desktop installation itself. Yes. Oh, okay. So, um, that's not going to screw anything up that I accidentally did a half, a uh, half baked command there. Right. No, 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 not at all. Okay. okay. So, um, did it was, was everybody able to get the prerequisites done? The, you know, getting an AWS account, a GitHub account, Saskel account, and then installing the software components. I um, did have I did have to add that um, McAfee gave Node.js a really hard time. It shut oh. it down every time I tried to use it before I put it on the exemption list. So gotcha. Yeah. What some some web or uh, some um, antivirus software see Node.js as a virus. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Rich, um, I actually had some issue with the uh, SAS Glue signup. Uh -huh. um, when I selected the new user on the site, it said it would be looking for a security code. Yeah. And I yeah. didn't receive the email in my um, inbox or spam folder. I think uh, oh. Jack said this is a, a known issue. In either one? Yeah. Um, can, can we, uh, let's see, can we walk through that right now? Yeah, sure. right now. Yeah, I had some challenges uh, yeah. with the with the sign up of the SAS Blue account as well. Worked through them, but uh, the the authenticator, the the confirmation code that was sent, it was a little bit flaky. Gotcha. So, yeah, it, it does generally go to the spam folder. Um, so, we're probably going to replace that with uh, SMS. That seems to be what companies are doing. Okay. Did you just want me to share my screen? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, I'll have to hang on. I have to get Edge as a co-host to do that. I had some of the same issues there, but it went to spam both times. Yeah, but I did get the email. I at first I couldn't find it until I, I saw the email. Check your check your spam. But 
Okay. Yeah, mine came through as well eventually, uh, pasting the code into the, the input validation. That was a little bit frustrating as well. It kept wanting to auto tab into the next field and. Yeah, yeah, Co copy and paste it into those fields is a challenge. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you want to click new user start here. Okay, and that's, you're sure that's your, ex okay, so yeah. I don't think that's the right email address, there we go. Yeah. No, okay. I don't know why that came up, but yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, can you check your, your email, see if it came through? And okay. Now I had to check this in Gmail. I had to go right to the spam folder. Seemed to go there directly. Yep. Yeah. Same on my end. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I have it now. Okay. Cool. Okay. So enter the code. And then stop sharing your screen before you enter your password because um, <laughs> we, uh, our, our, our web guy disabled the password masking functionality for this build and we haven't put it back in yet. How long is the timeout on that confirmation code, Rich? Um, I think it's uh, a couple of minutes. I'm not sure exactly. I'd have to check. Okay, hey, cool. So it looks like you're in. Awesome. Okay. Um, so uh, was there anybody else that was having uh, problems getting signed up for SASCLU or with any of the any of the other prerequisites? So Rich, I I and I didn't have problems getting set up, but as I got down to run the spa build pipeline for AWS, uh -huh. that's, I ran the first one. And that's what I was telling you on the uh, running job for create EC2 instance. I got, I'll, I'll put the, the error here in the chat, if you can see it. Um, Oh, so it's, okay. it's Python errors, name errors. Um, and the one thing when I ran this first time, I, I noticed that my runtime parameters didn't take. So I'm not sure I had, I had two browsers open. Maybe I, I'd closed one or something because they were just showing the, the wild card. Then I went back in and added, you know, the IDs uh, that I thought were correct. There were about, let's see. I mean, there's several of these key value pairs, right? Yeah. In the README, they kind of all blend them all together, but I just, for every name equals, I assumed it's a new runtime variable, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, if you could share your screen, Brett, um, we can look at your, uh, well, actually, yeah, you, you could have credentials in, in your script. Um, so when you look at the, at the job monitor, okay, um, and 
you click on the monitor link next to the um, SPA job that failed. Um, is it the create EC2 instance task that failed or configure EC2 or? Yeah, no, it's the first one. So you've got, okay. you've got create EC2 instance, then configure EC2 instance, and then create ECR repository. Okay. So it, it looks like it's stepping down through it, and it's failing at the first one and then, and then doesn't continue. Right, right. Yeah, so um, click on that, click on the, that first link um, next to create EC2 instance. And let's look at the, so if you click on create EC2 instance, um, you're gonna see your task that, or the step that failed. And there's a link to click on the script so that you can see the script that was executed. Okay, I see it, yeah. Yeah, now there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, but I think you're right. If you look through that script is, if you just search through it, is there like an at SG symbol or something like that? I'm looking for, cause it looks like it's an SG variable, right? Yeah. The other thing that you can do is you can click on the standard out or the standard error, maybe the standard error in this case. And it should have um, some information as far as like the stack trace or something um, so that you can see where the problem was in the script. Oh, okay. Yeah. Standard error. Um, init Python loads. So value error, no JSON object could be decoded. Would that be the error? That's what the standard error is that I'm seeing now. Error message, no JSON object could be decoded. Then it goes to the stack trace. And but it looks like, you know, a Lambda function line five. So let me look there. And this is probably gonna be not line five from the very top. Unless it's, what is it possible it's one of these import statements for the Python script or is that not really possible? No, no, Python starts counting lines further down, probably past the import statements. It could be that launch EC2 instance statement. Um, Brett, if you scroll down to the bottom, um, near the bottom, you've got a line that says res equals launch EC2 instance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. OK. Um, and so the arguments should be like, you know, single quote AMI dash a bunch of numbers, single quote. And then the next argument should be single quote, the name of your key pair, single quote. And then single quote t3.small, probably single quote. And then after that, and this might be where the problem is, um, you should have left bracket, single quote, sg dash a bunch of, a bunch of stuff single quote, right bracket. So there's a few of these res ones. It's res ec2 client dot, um, what, what should be the method after that? Um, okay, let's back up. Um, so you've got launch ec2 instance the first argument should be the, the uh, AMI ID. So it should be AMI dash something. Oh, okay. Okay, so I found launch e e EC2 instance. Well, the one I'm looking at is commented out. Let's see. 
so it's common in EC2 instance has the AMI instance. Oh, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the script. Okay. Or res equals launch underscore EC2 instance. Yeah, yeah. see AMI, the name of the Your key pair. IAM user or the key pair. The instance oh, type. Now, okay, now here's one. This might, the, I see where the security group ID is. Yeah. It's not in quotes, it's just. Yep. It's, this is a string. It's just SG dash. Yeah, yeah. Which so looks like it should be in quotes. Your instincts were correct. Yeah. So if you close that window and then click on the job name, SPA build pipeline, that'll take you to the job designer. Okay. And then you can click on runtime variables and look for security group IDs and the security group IDs, um, it's going to be an array of strings. So it should be, you know, left bracket and then a quote, and then your security group ID, and then another quote, and then another right bracket. Oh, okay. That, because what I wasn't sure where I was using the default security ID for a VPC. Uh huh. But I don't see an array of these values. I just see the. Oh, yeah. They, there's just one. Yeah. It, it's just an array of one, but that's what the brackets are for. Oh, I should, I should put it in a bracket. Yeah. Yeah. Bracket, single quote. Oh, you and probably had that in the README and I missed that small detail. There was a lot of details in there. <laughs> oh, okay. So, Brackets are meaningful. I was thinking that's you just put them in there, but now I see. So anything that had a bracket yeah. should have a bracket. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let, let, I'll proceed with this. Are there others that have questions? I don't want to take up everyone's time. Um, okay, so we've got some questions here. Okay. So, so Rich, just back on those, like agent download access key, all those should be in a bracket? No, no. And I'm sorry for that ambiguity. Um, that's the only thing that is not, uh, that where the brackets aren't just, you know, substitute your thing inside these brackets. And I tried to indicate it by putting double brackets and then your AWS default security group Right. Oh, but, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry okay. for that confusion. Um, so yeah, go, go ahead and fix that, Brett, and then um, just hit enter uh, after you've entered the new value. Okay. And so when I unmask it and then I just go back does it save it? There isn't anything that says like save, but I'm assuming it does save it. It saves it automatically. Yeah, just okay. hit, hit enter and it saves it automatically. Okay, and then I could just go run job now. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. It's running. So um, for the for the other people um, that were able to sign up, was there anybody that I had problems um, with the first step in the pre-workshop setup. Um, copy the SPA build pipeline repo to your GitHub account. Did anybody run into trouble following those steps? Okay. Um, how about the AWS setup? Does anybody have any questions? on the AWS setup. Okay. Um, we talked about the SAS glue setup. Now after, so the first step is just creating an account. Um, then there's some, you know, team variables uh, to configure um, 
creating some ask access keys and then importing the SAS glue jobs. Uh, did anybody have any problems with those steps that they have a question about? Uh, so Brad, uh, the solution that you just mentioned, I tried that, but uh, my uh, job still failed, but I got a different error this time. Uh, what, was, what was the error that you got this time? Let me post that. Okay. It says no JSON object can be decoded. Okay. Uh, Brett. That looks similar to mine. Oh, even you got it? Did you get another error, Brett? I got another error. I'm looking at it. It looks very similar to the last one. So I'm just checking that it is different. Same global name. So I'm looking at the script again to see if it copied it right this time. Okay, so no JSON object could be decoded. So we can probably uh, narrow that down by looking at where we're, um, where we have a JSON.loads. Okay. So this is probably um, a failure in the either the API login. Okay. Yeah, it's probably a failure in the API login. So um, what we can do. So, well, if we look at the parameters in the API login, um, we have an access key ID and an access key secret. So if you, let's see. If it wasn't a completely new AWS account, you might have something weird on there like MFA required or something. Yeah. No, this is a completely new account. So if you look at your script, um, wondering what you have for your access key ID. In, in the security group, should it be, so it's in an array, but should it still be delimited as a string with a quote? For the security group IDs? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because maybe that's still my problem because I'm failing the same spot, but I'm seeing I just have the uh, array and then the value, but it's not a string. It's so maybe that's the next point I failed to do. Although the error that you're getting now is 
is different. Um, so, uh, well, I'm not getting that error. Oh, you're not getting that JSON, that uh, um, no JSON object could be decoded error? No, I'm getting it. So I think we have two different errors. Mine is the global name SG not defined error. Okay. Again. Okay, so, um, so uh, R. Gupta, um, coming back to your question, if you click on the... So, uh, uh, um, before you go ahead, I think I added a wrong parameters or runtime variables, so I fixed that up. Okay. But now I think something else is screwed up and I'm testing that up now. It's okay. with the instance profile. The instance profile. Yep. Um, let me show you where is it. Yeah, this uh, this create EC2 instance um, Python script. Um, it's actually uh, kind of cool what it's doing. Um, so in this script, it's uh, defining um, a script uh, basically as a string um, that is going to be used to bootstrap the um, the EC2 instance that that gets created. Um, so basically it's, it's instantiating an EC2 instance and bootstrapping it with a script that, you know, is just defined right here. So that script that runs when the EC2 instance starts. And in this case, um, it's going out to the Sasflu API and downloading the agent and running it. Um, we've got some other stuff that you know, some similar things that, uh, that configure that uh, agent so that, you know, it's set up to run through like a queue of tasks. And when there's no more work to do, then it automatically shuts itself down. So, you know, lots of times you, you have companies that are reticent about going to the cloud um, because they have these cloud costs that just go out of control because, you know, resources get spun up and then they don't, you know, get spun down and they're just sitting there doing nothing and they're paying for it. Um, so this is kind of a nice model to, you know, spin up a bunch of resources that perform some task and then, you know, when it's done, they automatically shut themselves down. So, um, Brett, is that going any better at this point? Yeah, I did get past that. And my apologies, you had the example of how to do it and I just didn't follow there's directions. A lot of, but... There's a lot of detail to follow there. So. so so, the next one I'm getting though is now an auth error of, uh, oh, I just lost it, but it was, if you run the job, is there a way to get back? I, I jumped out or do I yeah. just have to run it again? If you click on the monitor. Oh, monitor. Okay. There it is. And will the, is the top one, the most recent one? Oh, yeah. yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if I look at the standard error, it is AWS is not able to validate the provided access credentials. Okay, um, and which line of the code is that from? Uh, well, it looks like var task Python line 52, launch EC2 instance, is that, does that sound right? Yeah, okay. So it doesn't like your AWS credentials. So um, at, the, at the top of the script where it instantiates the Boto 3 session, um, it, should, it should say like session equals Boto 3 dot session parentheses AWS access key equals and that should, and then you should have your AWS access key ID in single quotes. Oh, okay. So I see launch EC2 instance, that one? No, it it, here, I'll put it in the oh, chat. Okay. The Boto client or? Boto3.session. So and I see that in the script, not in the standard error. Correct. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Sorry. Oh, yeah. It's null. So obviously, I don't have it set here. Yeah. Now these are probably the um, team variables. Um. So let's see. Yeah, okay, so if you if you look at step three in the README, the Sasglue setup, um, so you've got create Sasglue account, and then the first step is to create the account. Um, the second is to um, configure team vars. Um, and here's where you put in your AWS access key ID and secret access key um, from your AWS setup. Yeah. Okay, let me look at those again. I thought I did those, so let me check. So, um, yeah, to get to look at your team vars, just click on the vars link at the top in the top sort of menu bar. Oh, okay. And you should have um, AWS access key ID and AWS uh, secret access key. Okay, so I see AWS region, AWS access key, not key ID, but that same thing. And then AWS secret access key. Yeah, so the access key ID has to be spelled exactly the same here as it is in the script. Oh, so I probably left underscore ID off. Is that is that the issue? Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's defined here, so okay. Yeah, so you can just create a new one um, and then delete the old one. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions or? Was Argupta's problem solved? Um, no, I'm still figuring it out. I don't know what, where exactly should I make a change? So I'm posting my error in the chat. It's probably related to runtime variables. Um, I, you know, the scripts, the scripts do work, um, but it, it could be related to access um, or runtime variables but um are are you still getting that no json ob object could be decoded no uh okay okay new one all right um instance profile dot name is invalid let's see i'm calling the run instances operation value okay this is probably a problem of um I uh, not having single quotes around 
Is there a variable called Ritesh? Uh, let me check uh, where I can check my variables. Um, in, okay, so are, are you on the monitor page right now? Yep. Okay, at, at the top left, um, click on the name of the job. Okay. And okay, that, I got, it. got it. Yeah. And then click on the runtime variables tab. Uh huh. And you know they're masked, but you can. So I got the one which has with the tag I am role has the value retouch. Okay. Okay. Um. So. So what should be the role? It should be the user that we create on the IAM or something else. Yes. Yeah. But it should have a codes out, uh, outside the name. No, it, sh it doesn't need to be in quotes. Um, is, and that is the name of your IAM role? Yep. Uh, that is the name of the user that I created. OK, let me. Let me check um, that it may, there, there might be a difference with the I am role in the username. I'm logging into my AWS account to check. Is it me or, or are AWS's captures like impossible to decipher? I don't know if anybody else has run into that. Maybe it's just really good at picking out traffic lights. <laughs> no, the, these are where they have like numbers and letters, but they're all funky, right? So oh, that, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so on the instructions where you want us to push to our own repo, is a, can we just make a fork of the existing repo and uh, just change the origin for the spa build pipeline? There's a... I found that confusing for just to, to set like the access and everything. Yeah, um, I think you need to put it in your own repo um, because you're gonna set up a GitHub action and that's gonna include your credentials, right? So you want you don't wanna put that in our repo. No, no I, I forked, I forked the, the spa to my own repo and then I'm just changing the room. Yeah, mode. yeah, you can do that. Yeah, that that's okay. just another way of doing the same thing. Yeah. Okay. As, as long as it's in your repo, it's fine. Right. Okay, so let's see. Coming back to your question. Retest. Okay, yeah. So your IEM role is different from your username. So if you go into your AWS account, you go to IEM uh -huh. and click on roles. Uh-huh. And uh, um, so you should have a role for um, EKS admin. EKS admin. So put that in um, for your IEM role runtime variable. Oh, OK. Because the uh, readme says the name of the IEM user you created in step two. So yeah, sorry about that. Um, I will fix that. So Rich, my next- Yeah, you're right. Okay. I'll fix that. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. So uh, my next error was uh, with the subnet ID. So, and I had a question on this on what subnet the default, I think it was asking for the default subnet. Uh, and it was for US East 2, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not one that we necessarily create, it's just it's in your account and we go, because there is a default subnet that's already there. I got, yeah. the, I got the VPC ID, but it's saying the subnet ID doesn't exist. Okay. Um, so when you go in your AWS account, um, log in and set the region to US East 2. 
by and the way you do that is there are like three drop down um, yeah sort of arrows. so so i'm in the vpc dashboard is that what you mean yeah and i yeah. and then I'm, I'm going up and selecting ohio yeah us east two right yeah and then and then it shows subnets and there's oh, okay so actually there's th so there's three subnets in here yeah just just pick pick one i went with us east 2b but it shouldn't matter oh okay so yeah i must have i must not i must have been in us east one or something let's see yeah it's easy mistake to make um rich yeah so now i'm getting a different error for um, it's an unauthorized operation okay and i it says you're not authorized to perform this operation um and i think it pastes my key or something okay so this is an aws error Yep, for the Lambda. Standard alpha step AWS Lambda. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's probably not a Lambda error. Um, it's, in, it's in the create EC2 instance step, right? Yep. Okay. So um, let's see. I, I'm guessing that... So that so really the only thing that this step is doing is creating an EC2 instance. Correct. So if I had to guess, I would say that um, maybe the EKS admin role doesn't have all the rights that it needs to have. So should I go to EKS admin role and check the policies? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. If I go there and I see for policies, it says for EC2, it has full access tagging and limited for list read and write. Okay. Um, so if, okay, so you went to roles and you clicked on EKS admin. Yep. Okay. And then let's, um, okay. So under permissions, um, you've got uh, a grid, that has policy name and policy type, and you should have EKS admin in that grid. Uh, uh, in the permission sections, uh, where? Yeah, so so you've got the permissions tab, uh -huh. and then it shows permissions policies, one policy applied. Correct. And then under that, attach policies. Yep. Under that, policy name. Yep. And right then under that, EKS admin. Yep. So if you click on that, uh -huh. um, you should have a bunch of JSON in the policy summary. Uh, okay, yep. And it should, you should have like action auto scaling attach instances and then a bunch of auto scaling yep. stuff and then a bunch of EC2 stuff and then EKS, IEM, et cetera, yep. et cetera, down to KMS. You've got all that? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so then the next question is if you click on users. Okay. And you click on the user that you use to create your AWS credentials. So I created a different user. So I'm currently logged in as a root user. Uh -huh. I created a different user from using the IAM. Okay. Yep, that's the right thing to do. Um, so click on that user. Uh huh. And uh, what do you have under permissions for that user? So it has EC2 full access, S3 full access, EC2 admin pass role, and I am user change password. Okay, so there's pro there's probably some access that that it needs that it doesn't have. Um, 
we, you know, you can troubleshoot it right now, or you can just add administrator access and, you know, then work backwards from there, see if that fixes this problem. Um, yeah. But yeah, or, or you could look at the exact error, you know, and, and dig into, okay, what's the exact, um, what's the exact permission that's missing, but. Brett, how's it going for you? Getting further. So here's my next error. So invalid IAM instance profile name. Invalid IAM instance. Yeah, that's I, that's my bad. So um, this is the same thing Ritesh ran into. So change a runtime variable for the SPA build pipeline job. I am so the I am role. Yeah, should be EKS dash admin. That's my fault. Okay. So it's not the one we created, it's it's just fixed. Uh yeah. That, well, well yeah. you so did I create did, it. Yeah, I did create this is the username, but I think you're asking for the role we created, right? Yeah, and it should be EKS dash admin. I did update the README. Um okay. But yeah. So. Okay, and I'm just verifying I had that role I created. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? So, Rich, I, I, if it might might be worth if there aren't questions and we're getting this going for you to, could you maybe demo what we should be seeing for maybe I'm sure I'm sure there's a few that haven't done the prerequisites, so they're kind of viewing it. And sure. I don't want to frustrate them with my own problems of not following directions, but no, no it, it's a lot, a lot of detail. Like I said, there's a, there's a lot of technology um, in this and these are really powerful tools. Um, I can, let's see, what would be the best thing to show? Um, yeah, let me just actually run this. And, you know, pride for the group, part of this was like this whole EC2 stuff that I think we're, we're kind of running into issues. This was one of the things I, I talked with Rich earlier when I was looking at the prerequisites and just kind of knowing our audience that it might be too much to ask everyone to set up their own EC2 instance and all this stuff on this, on this first try. So that is part of the script you added, right? That this... Sasku is doing that for us so that we don't have to have to worry about creating our own EC2 instance to get this set up. So that's kind of the, the benefit of using a tool like this, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so this, this job that we're running, um, which I named uh, SPA Build Pipeline Init AWS, um, is, you know, creating your default EC2 instance um, it's configuring it and then it's creating your ECR repositories. So, I mean, it is a bit painful, you know, getting the credentials and stuff set up, which I really can't do, 
you know, you really can't just automate that because, you know, because you have to get the credential. Um, but, you know, once you get past that, it does make it really easy to get the environment set up, you know, relative to, you know, going and figuring out how to set up EC2 instances and configuring ECR repositories and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that is, that is, you know, the benefit of, um, of using a tool like this. Um, so what, it, yeah, if that would be beneficial, let me go ahead and bring this up and I'll run this, uh, I'll run this job in my own environment and um, just so we can see what's going on. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so this is, this is the Sasglue job um, designer, which is part of the Sasglue job console. So we, so we have this job named SPA build pipeline uh, init AWS. And we have three tasks. The first task um, creates an EC2 instance. This is the one that we've been troubleshooting. Um, this actually runs as uh, an AWS Lambda job. And the way this works, so Sasglue has a dedicated AWS account um, that is configured to uh, run customer AWS scripts. It's locked down. Um, so you can define a script in Sasglue, which could do anything, right? That any script would do. And you can run it in Sasglue's AWS Lambda account. Um, so you know, this script is uh, basically creating an EC2 instance and then bootstrapping it um, to uh, download the Sasglue agent. So, um, uh, so that's the first um, task in this job. The next task configures the EC2 instance. Um, first, it runs a script to uh, install Terraform. And you know we we're using this script in this job, but um, the script is defined in a script library. Um, so uh, we've got you know in SAS Blue a script library where we've defined this script, and so you could use this script in any in any job where where Terraform was a requirement. Um, and you know, it's just a script that installs Terraform and any machine that you run this on that's compatible with yum, it's going to install Terraform. Um, and then similarly, we run a script to install Git. Um, oh, and, and you know, if you've got like a team of people, these scripts and jobs and everything are shared across the whole team. So it's a nice uh, way to, to share code. So it installs Terraform, Git, and the AWS CLI. Um, and then the last step creates the ECR repositories. Um, so first we install a prereq. We install the Boto3 um, Python package, which is uh, the AWS SDK for Python. And then we run the script that we've defined that um, create some ECR repositories using the uh, um, Boto3 uh, package. Um, this is actually injecting a script from the library called ecraccess.py. So um, this script is uh, um, this script defines this create repository um, acts, or a function which creates an ECR repository. So we can inject this into this script and then access that functionality um, with this at SGS syntax. Um, so when I run this job, um, to run it, I just click on the job name, I click on the run tab, click run job, and now I can click on the link to the running job. 
and I can see the tasks um, that are executing. Right now it's uh, running this create EC2 instance step. And as it's running, you're gonna see the standard out um, tail uh, updating in real time. One thing that is cool about this, uh, kind of from a, a team perspective, um, if we had multiple team members that were looking at this monitor, um, all the team members would be seeing the same updates at the same time. So, you know, updates uh, to running scripts are pushed out to all the browsers um, that are open for that team. Um, you can also click on the script and see the script, which, uh, you know, shows the actual script that you ran and you can see the full standard out by clicking on the standard out button. So um, it finished, it said, hey, I launched one EC2 T3.small and it gives me the instance ID. Um, so now our second task is running, which is executing three steps. Um, it installed Terraform, installed Git, and currently it's installing the AWS CLI. And Rich, with these Lambda functions, can you implement them in any language that Lambda supports? Exactly, yeah. The way it works, um, basically it takes your script and uh, it packages up, packages it up as an AWS Lambda function. It registers with it with AWS, um, kicks it off, monitors the cloud watch logs related to that AWS, related to that Lambda function and reports them uh, back to uh, SASGlue, you know, to give you real time feedback while it's running. Okay, so create ECR repositories um, completed. Um, so the job completed. So um, so one of the things that we saw here was the instance that got created, right? So if we now go into uh, my AWS account and we can filter by this job ID. And so we have this, uh, this instance that's now running, okay? Um, if we click on it, we can see the internal IP address. If we come back to SASGlue, um, we can click on the agents tab and uh, here's our agent that was just created. Um, I, we can see the internal IP address 30 255, which is the same one that we're seeing right here. So, this is the instance that got created, and we bootstrapped it to automatically download the SAS Glue agent and run it. So, now that it's running, so I can name it something else like Terraform admin or something. And uh, so now it shows up as Terraform admin. So now that it's running, um, I can run any script, right? So if I've got like this hello world script and I say, okay, I wanna run it on my Terraform admin agent. I, I just clicked run script and it ran it. So, and that obviously that's a really simple example, but it could run any script, right? Like we like we're seeing, um, you know, it could be a script that creates, you know, resources in AWS. It could run a database backup. It could, um, you know, basically do anything that you can write code to do. So, and, and in any language, um, it's not restricted to shell scripts or Python or no JS, you can, you know, run code in any language. So, um, okay, uh, how are things going? Do we have any questions? It 
so I'm I'm back to the next error on mine. Uh, encoded authorization failure message. So let's see. Yeah, it looks like a permission error. When calling run, it says you are not authorized to perform this operation. Okay. Um, and what's the operation? Um, the function is Lambda function line five, Lambda handler. Okay. Launching one yeah. it, it's, the, it's the EC2 launch. Uh, Ritesh, were you able to get past that? That was where we had talked about um, adding administrator access to your your um, user. Okay. I could do that, so. Yep, I, I was able to pass that. Like I gave administrative access. Okay. Yep. And how far have you gotten, right, Ritesh? Uh, I I saw that the first task passed, but it didn't proceed any further, and it uh, it was waiting for someone some host. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It waits for that EC2 instance to start up. Um, is it still waiting, or did it run? Uh, let me confirm that. I oh, know it failed on my keys. Okay. I think there's some wrongs with my keys. Let me fix that up. Okay. Um, so Brett, uh, did you did you get what to do to get past that credentials issue? Well, I'm trying to what what is the runtime variable I should be using to put my I am user. Okay, so um, this is this isn't a runtime variable issue at this point. This is the rights of the user that you use to generate your credentials that you put in the the team bars. Oh, the access keys and the secret key. Yeah. Stuff. So if you go to your AWS account and you go to your I am user that you use to generate your credentials. Yeah. Let me check those again. And so I'm so I'm looking at the user that I created just for this. Um, so he has Amazon EC2 full access and Amazon S3 full access. Uh, and then he has that EC2 admin pass role, right? Is yeah, that the so one? There, that, is that the one we need to edit? Yeah, there's some there's some access that we're missing here, and I'm not sure what it is. Um, so easiest thing is just probably for now to add administrator access, um, and then you can, you know, work back from that and remove it um, later. Okay, just from like a, a policy then? Don't don't yeah. mess with the JSON, just... Yeah. Yeah, just click add permissions and choose administrator access. Um, so Rich, uh -huh. uh, my FP in it passed, the FP Abel pipeline passed completely, uh, do I, does it trigger the other pipeline automatically or? No, no, so um, click on your agents link and let's just make sure that um, the agent is running and connected. So I see that it is, the status is active. Okay, 
Okay, good. And it should have tags Terraform equals true. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, so the next step. Um, let's see. So, so in the prerequisite steps, that's step four. Um, so the next would be five, and this is making configuration changes to the SPA build pipeline code. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, if you want to go through those changes, Ritesh, and if you have any questions, then, um, then you know I'll be happy to to answer them. So the next step is is to modify this code, and you know I tried to make it as generic as possible, but there there are some things that you know, you just, it, you, it was impossible to make it completely generic. Um, the next step is going to be uh, to um, put your, so to create some Sasko API access credentials and then to put them into GitHub. Um, and so that, that's it for the prereq steps for the, for the uh, build pipeline. Um, after that comes sort of the more cool stuff, which is where we're going to build the app, deploy it and see it running. Um, but let's just see how far we get. Um, Brett, what, what is our timeline looking like? When, when is, when are we scheduled to go to? Well, we schedule it to eight. So okay. we're running, we're running a little out of time. Um, but we can continue next week uh, and and even follow up the following week. And maybe, I don't know, these are always kind of tough to troubleshoot um, online yeah, and, or email, but. Yeah, between now and the next workshop, um, if anybody has any questions, um, they, can, they can email me. Uh, uh, let me just put my email address. in the chat window, just rich at sasclu.com. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to help answer any questions uh, between now and the next workshop, but let's see how far we can, we can get before eight. So I think I'm running into the same error that Rich was we're just running into with the invalid key pair. And unfortunately I wasn't paying as much attention to the solution that you came up with. Oh, oh yeah, think, uh, Brad, you might have created a key pair in US is one. And if oh. it is trying to create an instance in US is two. Oh, that, that might be, because I usually am US East one, so let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I missed that part. So I'll I'll create another key pair. Okay. So Rich, what what I mean, what was your vision of uh, how this was going to go? as far as today, I, I think you mentioned trying to get to the install piece, but is that something you can demo too, or if, or do we need to wait for everyone to get their prerequisite set up? Um, as far as uh, installing your uh, keys in, Git, in uh, GitHub, or running the job that actually launches the app, um, I guess, I guess launching, launching the app. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Maybe, maybe it's just kind of a primer for everyone to, that just so they know what we're trying to get to. Right. So we yeah. don't discourage them like, Hey, this meetup, we had a couple people chatting that don't read, read me's very well. And now I'm trying to get this done. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, let me share but my Maybe they can me. see what the, what the end goal is. Everyone will be a little more excited to participate. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen screen again. Um, so, so once we get all of this configuration stuff done, um, we're going to run this um, Sasglue job, uh, init build pipeline demo. And for those who haven't gotten to this step in the workflow yet, after you um, you create your Sasglue account and do some configuration. Uh, there is an import file, like a Sasglue job import file um, in the GitHub repo. And you can come into the job designer and click this import job button and, uh, and then browse to this, uh, this export file that's in the GitHub repo. And it's going to import all of these jobs. It's going to create all the scripts and everything for you. Um, and one of the jobs that is going to be imported is this init build pipeline demo job. So um, there, there are three tasks in this workflow. Um, the first is going to uh, duplicate your Git repo. The next is going to create your EKS cluster. So EKS stands for um, uh, something elastic Kubernetes service, I think. I think that's what yeah. the E stands for. Yes, that's right. So it's it's AWS's um, uh, Kubernetes solution. Now, obviously, you can create your own EC2 instances and create like a custom Kubernetes solution in AWS. Um, but EKS makes it really easy or relatively easier um, to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. And so this step is going to do that. Um, and then the last step here is going to uh, start your EC2 instance that we created in this SBA build, build pipeline job that we've been working through um, in this session. Um, so let's just look at these scripts. Um, du duplicate git repo is just a shell script. Um, that's just mirroring a Git repo. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty straightforward. Create EKS cluster um, is actually using Terraform. Um, it's, and it's using a Terraform script that is included in the, uh, the Git repo um, that is the basis for this project. So there's some good stuff in those Terraform scripts um, for deploying EKS. Now, in the process of, of, doing, of creating this, um, this demo, this application, I, I tried a bunch of different ways of um, creating an EKS cluster and deploying an EKS cluster. And it turns out that by far the easiest way of doing it was with Terraform. And um, and the, you know if you if you dig in and you look at this Terraform code, it's actually basically creating a full production environment with you know multiple availability zones and you know elastic load balancer. Um, I, you know within this Kubernetes cluster, we've got a web application. Um, with uh, you know a front end, a client piece, an API, a Python script for you know downloading stock quotes, and within Kubernetes, these are all behind load balancers, so they scale, right? So this is this is like a you know production ready uh, you know environment, web hosting environment that it's creating. So there's a lot of value in that. So Sasglue is really just, you know, running this script. It's basically driving Terraform. Okay, um, so nothing, nothing magical about that. Um, and then starting the EC2 instance. This is just a, a Python script that we're running through AWS Lambda. That's one one of the nice things about um, using Sasglue to uh, create resources in you know, AWS, or it could be GCP, or Azure, or any other cloud resource, 
is normally you've got to have some compute running somewhere, right? That is going to start this instance. And that's compute that you're paying for probably, you're managing, right? It's like a pet, you've got to take care of it. Um, but, you know, if you run it through SAS glue as a Lambda function, you don't need to have any compute running in order to, you know, allocate resources, like in this case, an EC2 instance. It just runs through AWS Lambda. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And uh, we can see again, what's happening in the monitor. Um, it's duplicating our Git repo and also starting this EC2 instance at the same time. Okay, in this case, our start EC2 instance task failed. But I'll have to look into that. But we still have our, we already created that EC2 instance. So um, the rest of the job should run okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's because I destroyed the EC2 instance that um, that I had previously been using. And so obviously it didn't like that. So I tried to start an EC2 instance that didn't exist, but we don't need it in this case. So it doesn't matter. Okay, so our Git repo got duplicated and our EKS, uh, create EKS cluster is running. And so this failed. This configuration does not support Terraform version 1.0.0. Choose another supported Terraform version. Okay, so looks like uh, looks like there's a new version of uh, Terraform required version 0.14. Okay. So we're going to have to update the script to run a different version of Terraform. So that can sometimes happen with uh, live demos. <laughs> so is it, so what is, can you lock down versions of things? Cause that, that's a common problem we always have, right? Yeah. But sometimes you just, you'd like to be able to control when those versions have to take place. Yep, absolutely. Uh, is there is there a way in SAS Glue to do that or are you dependent on AWS and, and their infrastructure? No, you can absolutely do that because, um, you know, SAS Glue is just sort of running whatever you tell it to run. So um, I just need to configure this um, you know, configure this code to to lock in the version, like you said. So, 
that's something that I'll have to do. Um, So what, once we have this working in, in the next few workshops, um, the, was the plan to demo like like this web app and being able to show when we make an update, how that could be automatically deployed? Yeah, yeah. And and kind of walk it through its the regular life cycle of a, of a, of a standard web app, single yep. page web app. Yeah, that that is the goal um, to, you know, have everybody have a working environment where you have this single page web application that's running. Um, you can make changes to the code and they automatically, you know, go through your build and test and deploy um, process. And, you know, you basically see the updates in real time. So yeah, that's that's where we want to get. Uh, for, for the change for the version, um, I'm sitting in chat right now. Uh, so should if we're doing the fork, should we lock that to like 15? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah did, did you get that far to running the init build pipeline job? I haven't tried it yet, but I just want to know uh, if the if, if it's if it doesn't work with fourteen, if it, if you need yeah. for fifteen. Yeah, and I will fix this repo, and um, and uh, you know, then everybody can can uh, pull it and get the the correct version that works. Uh, also, are using uh, uh, for state are using uh, local backend or using yeah. anything like a Okay. Just local. Yeah. Okay. So those of us that did the mirror, Rich, how would you recommend uh, updating our own repos and just probably, there... well, what I'm actually going to be changing is the, um, the SAS glue jobs import. Um, so, I, what you can do is, um, I just, you know, pull the latest version of the repo for the, for the workshop and then just re-import that, that, uh, SAS glue jobs file, right? And that will apply the changes to, um, to your SAS glue jobs and that should, uh, fix the problem. Okay. Bridge, does SAS glue work exclusively with AWS then? Or does it also work with Google and other cloud providers? Um, yeah, so SAS glue um, can so the agent runs in uh, the agent runs on Windows, it runs on Linux, and it runs on Mac. So basically, anywhere that you can run the agent, um, you can you know you can use SAS glue. Okay. So for example, if you had an on-prem database server and you wanted to you know schedule a nightly backup job, right? Um, you could take the you could take that job right whether it's a script you know that uh, is doing the job itself or kicking off some other process that's doing the backup job however you run it you could create a script in SAS glue to do that then run the agent on that machine um, and then you know schedule that SAS glue job which will then run that SAS that script on that machine to run your, your nightly backup or weekly backup or whatever it is that you wanna do. So it's really about automating processes and it can do it on-prem, it can do it in the cloud, it can do it in Docker containers. 
Azure, GCP, AWS, um, basically anywhere. So for example, um, we could take this whole demo, right? Th this whole workshop, and we could build an equivalent one that works in GCP or Azure. And it could automate this whole process in those environments just as easily as it does AWS. And you just have, you'd have to port the specific cloud native type things that you needed for that environment. Exactly. Right. Yeah. You just have to, so like our scripts right now are, are using the AWS SDK. Well, we'd have to substitute that out for, you know, scripts that um, drive the GCP SDK or the Azure SDK. So can you explain a little bit more how the agent works for those of us that haven't tried it then? So the agent I, I take in this demo is gonna be running on that EC2 instance or if, where, where does the agent usually run? Cause you mentioned yeah. on-prem, but you probably wouldn't run it on your workstation as a developer, right? Or would you, would you no. do it there too? Not, not unless you wanted to either test on your developer machine or, you know, you had some job that you, you know, something that you want to automate on your developer machine. But, but no, you basically install it on all the machines where you want to run automated processes, right? Um, you can think of it similar to, um, you know, agents for, you know, Jenkins or, you know, Airflow, right, where you've got this sort of server, right, that is pushing out, you know, code to run to an agent. Now, the difference between SAS glue and like Jenkins or Airflow, or, you know, one of the main differences is with those tools, you have a server, right, that's sitting in the environment where you want to automate stuff. And, um, and, you know, and you maintain that server, right? Basically, SAS glue is the SAS version of that, right? Where you don't maintain the server, you don't set up the server, the server is basically the SAS glue API. Now, the other main difference is most of these automation tools like Ansible, you know, is another example. Um, the way that the, the server is executing code is generally over remote SSH. Airflow, it's a little bit different. Airflow uses kind of a, um, a pub sub model. Um, but with SAS glue, the agent um, does not require any incoming connection, right? So the, AP, the SAS glue API never goes out to the SAS glue agent on like, you know, port 9001 or something like that, you know, to say, hey, run this script. Um, basically, the SAS glue, uh, the, the SAS glue API to agent communication happens through PubSub, right? So when you run the agent, uh, it reaches out to a public PubSub server um, through SSL, okay, through HTTPS. And it subscribes to the relevant queues and um, so uh, when the SAS glue API uh, um, tries to run a script uh, or needs to run a script, it's basically sending that to the PubSub server, um, which then relays it over this connection that was initiated by the agent. So what that means is, first of all, it's much more secure, right? There's no opening holes in firewalls. You know, if you've got a Jenkins server on-prem, you want to automate some stuff in AWS, you're setting up VPN tunnels, you're opening holes in firewalls, it's less secure, it's a huge pain in the butt, it's going to take IT a year to get that set up. Whereas with SAS glue, you run the agent on your EC2 instance, and, you know, now you can, you can automate a process on that. It could be a workflow where the first step is on-prem, the second step is in the cloud. But 
but that pub sub model basically allows the agent to, or allows you to, to automate processes in all of your environments um, without any, you know, incoming uh, firewall access. The, the other thing that's nice about that model is when you're running stuff over remote SSH, let's say that it's a, it's a long running job, a big data job, you know, Spark job or a long running database backup, something like that. If you lose that connectivity between the server and the, uh, and the, the target, right? The machine that's actually executing the job, um, the job is either gonna be orphaned or you know, it's gonna die. Whereas with the pub sub model, once the code is delivered to the agent, the agent is just gonna run it locally, right? So if there's a, if there's a break in connectivity, the agent just keeps trying to reconnect until connectivity comes back. Um, but you're not going to have to worry about your jobs like failing or being, or your scripts, you know, being orphaned or anything like that. Yeah. I, we, I've had a lot of those kind of issues, like with control M and stuff like that, where networking decides to do an update while you're running a big batch job and everything goes red and you don't know why. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we've all been there. I think you've already mentioned this, but I, on like on some of these, like uh, turning like the EC2 instance off and making sure that it it goes away after you've started it up. Uh, how How is that, how are those kind of things configured? Or like in this, EKS instance where, well, look, I want to deploy it. I, I don't necessarily need everything running all the time, but once it's deployed, of course, I want the Kubernetes clusters to stay up and running. I don't want it destroyed. How does that, how does SAS Glue manage that? Yeah, sure. That's a really good question. And let me share my screen so I can kind of show you how that works. Um, okay, so. So there's two ways you can configure this. Um, one is through the GUI, right? So you click on an agent and under the settings down here, um, you can configure an, an inactive agent timeout, right? And this is gonna be a timeout in terms of running SAS glue jobs, right? So um, let's say, you know, you have, you know, some, some task that that needs to be run maybe there's like a queue of jobs that need to be run and you, so you create an ec2 instance um to run that job um and you want the ec2 instance to run that job and all the jobs that are queued up and then stop okay so this inactive agent timeout is going to basically say you know if i set it to you know sixty thousand. Uh, milliseconds, so 60 seconds. Um, uh, I'm having computer problems. But anyway, you set that to 60,000 seconds, for example. And what's going to happen is um, if it hasn't gotten a new, a new job from SAS glue for more than that period of time, um, then it's going to run this job that you define here. So you could, um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so I've defined this job, stop agent and terminate EC2 instance. Um, and then you can pass in some runtime variables that would be passed to the job when it runs. So basically, if I save this, what's going to happen is if this agent doesn't get anything to do for more than the timeout period, um, then it's going to run this job. Um, now, this job, uh, if we take a look at it, OK, here, here's the script that runs. Um, so anyway, it's going to do some different things to, um, you know, 
get the ID of the agent that needs to be stopped. And um, ultimately, uh, it's going to, I haven't looked at this for a while. Yeah, it's going to run this AWS EC2 terminate instances um, script. Okay, so now that so this inactive agent job um, could do anything, right? It could send you a notification. Um, hey, you know this agent, you know this EC2 instance seems to be inactive, right? Um, it could actually stop it. There's a lot of things that you could do. Um, so that's that's basically how it works. Um, we didn't set it up to just like automatically kill the host after a period of inactivity because that may need, may not be what you want, right? Yeah. Um, so, and one thing that, that we're sort of working on that's in the pipeline is to make these kinds of, um, of uh, jobs available through like a library, right? So, you know, and if there's anybody out there who's a good web designer, contact, contact us. We're not good web designers. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure somebody else could make this look really cool. Um, but what we're going to have is sort of like a library of scripts, right, that you can import, right? So, or jobs, right? So this job that you know, um, starts up an EC2 instance and runs until it doesn't have anything else to do and then shuts itself down, right? That would be something that you could import and then, you know, leverage in, in your own environment. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Right, is that pretty yeah. clear? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, one thing that is kind of different about SAS Glue is a lot of these tools are going to like the no code, low code um, model. And we've sort of like gone in completely the opposite direction with SAS Glue. And it's because what we find, and it was, so my brother and I really developed this. We're both software architects. Um, he's actually a better engineer than me. He's a distinguished engineer. But we found that with a lot of these tools, you, you at some point you basically hit a brick wall, right? And there's something that you needed to do and it, and it, it doesn't do it and you end up having to, you know, find workarounds, find ways around it. And so, and the reason we call it SAS glue is, well, first it's SAS based, but it's a way of filling those gaps, right? So yeah, you've got this Terraform script that can spin up your Kubernetes environment and that's great, but how do you kick it off in response to a push to GitHub, right? Well, SAS glue is, um, sort of bridges that gap. And, and that's kind of the point of this, this particular demo. And uh, the more we get into it, we'll, we'll be able to show, you know, how it bridges that gap. Great. So we're about out of time. Uh, other participants, anyone have questions for Rich? And Rich, what recommendations, I guess, would you have for everyone too, uh, if there aren't any questions for getting ready for the for next week and in between, I guess. So I, I have a big to do, which is to uh, figure out this Terraform version uh, issue and fix that. Um, and when I do that, I will push this repo um, and Brett, I'll let you know when that's done. Um, and, uh, and then if you could communicate it out to, uh, to the group, that would be great. Um, I would suggest just continuing to follow the steps um, in the readme. And again, if you get stuck, I put my um, email in the chat window. It's rich at sasglue.com. Um, don't hesitate to send me an email if you, you know, run into pr any problems, if you have any questions about anything um, and, you know, if we need to, to set up a call, um, you, you know, obviously, uh, working around, you know, my schedule and your schedule, um, but I'm happy to, uh, um, to do that as well. So.
and I think the the meetup. I, I thought you guys got the emails from some of the questions of some of the participants, right? If they just even go to the meetup and said, "Hey, I step three, I'm having this problem," and then email directly is probably a good way. And yeah. for the group, I I use our community email list. Uh, I think that's a pretty good way to to send information to everyone. So when Rich, you have a new update, I'll probably just use that. Remind everyone of the up, of the upcoming uh, the next meetup, and I'll put put the details on the repo as well. But does that does that reach everyone? Is that a good way to communicate? I, I'm not sure of a better way, unless others have ideas on that. Sound, sounds good. So, Rich, we sure appreciate your help with this and everyone for your patience today. I, I hope, hope everyone had a chance to learn something. Um, you know, I mean, what, what, what shows to me again, a lot of these, a lot of these tools are not trivial. And as much as we've made a lot of progress on making cloud computing easier, it still, still takes a bit of work. And, that's why I like tools like this that can kind of help simplify some of that. Because if you've done anything in AWS or 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 Google, it's it's they're great, except it's so massive. It's like flying a 747 and knowing what controls to to push and knowing that six months ago you set that up and now you don't remember how to do it anymore. So having your software as code is is a real benefit to anyone doing any type of DevOps, I think. So you can always go back to the code and know that it worked, except when the Terraform version has to change and stuff like that. So we've we've <laughs> those, those issues right. Yeah. Well, thanks, Brett, and uh, thanks everybody. Um, and uh, you know, like like I said, contact me if you if you uh, you know hit any roadblocks. And um, I guess we'll do this again next week, Brett. Yeah, same time, and we'll we'll play by ear if we want to do a fall put after that. But it, at least it's scheduled right now for next week, next Wednesday, six to eight again. Uh, we'll record it again as well. Um, but I think it, it would benefit everyone if they'll try to go through the prerequisites. Uh, it's it's a little bit of a learning curve, but I, I've learned quite a bit in the process, and it it becomes easier the more you try it, and then then we can kind of knock out these questions as they come up. Yeah, sounds great. Well, thanks, Brett and, and Andrea for getting this set up. We sure appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining us and thanks for all the work putting us together. It's been a great learning experience. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you, see you next week. See you next Take week. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.